changed. So let's talk a bit more about change before we talk about how to do it. Alan Duchman wrote a book called Change or Die. This is an interesting book, and, and if you, I'm, I encourage you to get it if you'd like to, but I can give you the thrust of the book. It goes like this. He talked to people who were told by their doctors they need to change or die. They're the kinds of people who had that really difficult moment when you finish your physical exam and the doctor takes an extra sigh and looks at you and says, do you mind doing me a favor? Why don't you pull your clothes on and come meet me in my office and let's talk for a bit more. And you're a smart human being. You know this doctor works on 12-minute intervals. He's just thrown off his whole day for whatever he's got to tell you and your heart begins to beat a little bit faster, right? And you walk into the doctor's office and you realize that the doctors, all the diplomas are sitting there, all the pictures of the family and the kids and all the awards, all the board certifications, all the fancy vacations that shows that he's been successful. And the doctor walks in and you're sitting there nervously and behind the very expensive desk he comes and settles in, opens up the file, looks at you, turns the file around, points it to you and points out the numbers and says to you, look, here's what I need you to know. With numbers like this, I have to be as clear with you as I possibly can be. You have to change your life today or you are going to die. Today. That what that means is if you have one more cigarette, one more drink, one more drug, you eat one more tasty cake, you're going to die. What Dushman found out is that when people were put in that situation, a situation where they were surrounded by clear authority with clear facts and with the, the possibility of uncontrovertible evidence with someone giving you complete attention and with all the authority of an expert giving you that clear of a choice. When a person is put in that situation, when given a choice, then only 90% of them will die. So if you're trying to figure out why it's hard to bring change to your church, you can take a deep breath. It's really hard. Now what Duchman did was really interesting. He did what's called a positive deviant study. And what that means is he didn't study the 90% and why they wouldn't change. He studied the 10% that did change. And here's what he discovered. When you talk about to the 10% that did change, did, that did change, he figured out, first of all, what doesn't work. Remember how I told you that leadership is disappointing people at a rate they can absorb? This next slide is really bad. I just want to warn you, because I call this slide, these are a few of my favorite things. These are the things I always think is going to bring change, and Duchman proves that it doesn't. What doesn't produce change is fear, facts, and force. We think if we only scare people enough, then they will change. I pastored at a church that was two miles away from the San Onofre Nuclear Generating Station. We were there, that's where I was, on 9-11, pastoring a congregation that was two miles from San Onofre Nuclear Generating Station and two miles from the Camp Pendleton Marine Base. And by the time the second plane hit the second tower, not only was the town completely on full alert, but that we were being told we had to be on extra alert because one of the perceived next targets could be the nuclear generating station. This is an entire town where everybody in town has been issued uh, iodine tablets so that if there's ever a nuclear reactor leak, we could take them to keep our thyroids from being burned out. That we, did a, that we literally did a, a drill every single ye year, once a year, the whole town did a drill based on whether or not there would be a new, in case there was a nuclear reactor leak. So the town was completely on hyper alert. And if, it's, if you can remember, if you were pastoring in 2001, you'll remember the same thing, that without any social media or any Twitter or any Facebook or anything like that, we just put the word out in an old-fashioned way that we we're going to have a church service that night, and that church was packed. We, pl we gathered people together in our sanctuary, and they were the pews were full, and the, rat and the walls were full, and people were sitting on the ground. And I remember looking at my worship director, and he looks at me and says, we're Presbyterians. We don't have time to plan a service. I said, all we're going to do is we are going to sing, great is thy faithfulness, and we're going to hug. And we're Presbyterians. We don't hug. And so, but that night, we were, that's what we were going to do, and that's what we did. 
and we passed around a microphone and we asked people, what do you think God might want to say to us at a time like this? And what we heard over and over and over again is people said, look, maybe it took a tragedy like this. Maybe it took something like this to bring us all back to God. Look, that we're all seeking him tonight. And sure enough, over the next few weeks, church attendance in the United States of America went up. But one year after 9-11, on 9-11-2002, George Barnett released a study that said that church attendance in the United States was at an all-time low, and it's been going down ever since. Fear creates a reaction against it. It doesn't bring change. Facts don't bring change either. I don't know about your denomination, but in mine, we put out a, we are big into facts. We are big into reports. We collect reports and data and facts and data. I mean, you, you might, you can, you can be iffy maybe on a couple of the doctrines of the Trinity, but you got to get your reports in, man. You get, you get, your numbers got to be in, right? And, it, and so because, I, I'm, is that a you thing too? I don't know, but like, but. But so because we believe if we just get enough data, then we can probably bring some big changes. And I'm all in favor of using every bit of facts we can. But we have now been on decline in our denomination for over 45 straight years. And every year we put out the facts and, and now we start having headlines like, hey, we didn't lose as many people as last year. Praise be to God. <laughs> facts don't change people. And the last one, and this is always depressing for all of the younger pastors in the room, force doesn't change people either. Like, like the, the, I, I, work with, I work with doctoral students who are all you know, on the younger side of their careers, and they're basically looking at me like, the secret is they're all sitting there thinking, look, once that last baby boomer dies and we're in charge, then things are going to change, man. All we, if you give us the power, our generation, we, we got it. And yet every, what we know is that you can go into power and think that you can use power to change people. And power doesn't change people. Most of the time, the culture, power changes you. I told you, this is depressing. It gets better from here. I just want you to know this. Because what doesn't produce change is fear, facts, and force. But here's what Alan Duchman says does. What brings change is relate, repeat, reframe radically. Let me just say, I'm going to give you all these slides later. I'll give you a way that you can get a link to, and you can download these and a bunch more and some other resources. You can take all the pictures you want. I don't care. But just know that I'm going to make sure that you can get all these slides and more. Relate, repeat, reframe radically. And that's what I want to talk about. And that's what the, the core of the kind of change that I think is necessary for us. New communities of people with new practices that lead them to new ways of thinking, reframing their thinking so that you can go to radical solutions. And by radical, I don't mean reckless and I don't mean ruthless. What I mean is solutions that go to the root of the core problem. You cannot tweak your way into lasting change. So here's the story. And if you've read the book, you know a bit about it and we've already hinted a bit about it, but let me give you the backdrop. I wanna take you to August 12, 1805. On August 12, 1805, Meriwether Lewis, who with William Clark had, start, had become, led the core of discovery, stood on the edge of what's called the Lemhi Pass. Now let me just tell you something a, little, a bit about this context. This story is like every human story. It is fraught. I have deep ambivalence about this story. It, it reminds me of when I read biblical stories. Um, one biblical story uh, author, uh, one biblical historian said, remember that the Bible characters are not given to us as models to emulate, but mirrors with whom we identify. It's very much the same thing for me when I tell the story of Lewis and Clark. Because this, what Lewis and Clark represent was the mental model of the day, which was built on this notion. Whoever could claim the water route would be the most powerful nation in the world. For over 300 years, that's what France and Spain had been working on. That had been the project of Europe for the better part of 300 years. The project that the United States took on as a brand new nation. Why Thomas Jefferson bought the Louisiana Purchase as if he could buy a land and a people and everything in it 
was that he believed that if he could claim the water route that would connect the Gulf of Mexico to the Pacific Ocean, then they could own the shipping lanes because it's always much more cost-effective to send heavy, raw material over water than over land. So owning the water route would be like owning the internet today. And for a young nation that was fearful that it was about to be reinvaded at any given time, getting as wealthy as possible was its project. So the core of discovery was to discover that water route. So as most of you know from here in Missouri, they took off out of St. Charles, Missouri. They headed up the Missouri River, and they had, were going to try to find what we now know as the Columbia River on the other side. Ships from the Pacific Ocean had come up the Columbia River. The only problem is that nobody ever found the connector. Whoever claimed that and owned that and had the rights to that would then own the shipping route, and that would be the key to the economic survival of this young nation. So Lewis and Clark and their Corps of Discovery headed up the Missouri River. For 18 months, they had gone upstream, 18 months. They were all water guys, and they were all guys when they started. And they took off, and they went up the Missouri River, upstream. They built their own keel boats when they were so confident in what they had that they sent their keel boats back. They learned how to do dugout canoes. They spent the winter with the Mandan tribe in North Dakota. And then they took off again and headed back up till they found to the place where they're on the edge of, the, of Montana and Idaho, right there at what's called the Lemhi Pass. On August 12, 1805, Mary Weather, Weather Lewis reaches down, takes a drink of water from a tiny spring this spring, the water from the spring flows all the way to the Gulf of Mexico. He and one of his men put their feet on each side of the stream. They exulted that they had conquered the mighty Missouri River. He walks up the side of the Lemhi Pass, expecting that they'll find the stream on the other side that will become the Columbia River. They'll have a half a day portage of taking their canoes over this little rise. They'll put them in the other side, and they'll get to go downstream. After 18 months of paddling as hard as they can upstream, they now get to coast downstream. They would float all the way to the Pacific Ocean. They would take a selfie and send it back to Thomas Jefferson. They would turn around and they would head home and they would be known as the great explorers who found the Northwest Passage that people had been looking for for 300 years. For 300 years, maps had been drawn that literally showed uh, the two rivers with just a dotted line in between. They would fill in that dotted line and they would find and claim the water route. And as you and I know today, they walked over the Lemhi Pass, looked over and found the Rocky Mountains. Now, a couple of things that are really important to note about this. Number one, the Mandan tribe knew the territory. This was their home turf. The Mandan tribe told them, hey, sure, there's a river over there, but you're going to have to go over mountains. And they said, mountain schmountains. We're from Virginia. We're great at mountains. <laughs> Anybody been to Shenandoah National Park? It's lovely. It's beautiful, really. It's lovely. But you can imagine with their kind of smoky, rounded hills, the idea of dragging a canoe over the top of them. When they heard mountains, they thought Shenandoah Mountains. They had no mental model for the Rocky Mountains with 14,000-foot peaks that would go above the tree line and stretch on for 300 miles. They were canoers. They were water guys. They were supposed to row their way, and now there's this giant mountain in the way. Here's the other part about it. They'd seen the mountains for three months. You can't really hide the Rocky Mountains. You, you guys been to Colorado? Like, they're, they're, I mean, it's like, so for three months, they had literally been staring at them, and they were writing in their journals things like this. I refuse to believe that there'll be anything but a safe and passable way. Why? Because our capacity for denial is huge. And what they did is they found themselves on top of the Lemhi Pass, Louis, Meriwether Lewis writes in his journal, we proceeded on. That's it. One of the men writes, those were the most horrible mountains we ever beheld. Why? Because they were water guys. And they were supposed to canoe their way into the future. How do you canoe over mountains? At this moment, what they had to confront was the world in front of them was nothing like the world behind them. 
That the ge- one geographer put it this way, the geography of reality, of hope, gave way to the geography of reality. And that they found themselves in this place. This is where I believe the church is today. We have for years been moving in the same geography, the geography of Christendom. For years we have become experts at it. We're expert canoers. We're experts at this world. We understood how to create big, successful, blessed churches in a Christendom world. Those of us in the main line saw this, saw our influence and our churches grow, and we became able to, be, to speak on a national, international stage because we were so competent in that world. And now we find ourselves at the edge of the Lemhi Pass, looking over and realizing that we're trained for canoeing and we have mountains in front of us. So what will we do? For some of us, we give up. I, I've always stu- been stunned that Meriwether Lewis didn't just go, well, the core of discovery was to discover a water route. There isn't any water route. Let's go tell Jefferson, send horses, and go back. For others of us, we get stuck. One of my friends who serves in Denver, Colorado, puts it this way. He said that Denver, Colorado was, an att- was, a, was a community of people who were all uh, braved their way across the Great Plains, all came to a moment where they looked up and said, right here, far enough. (laughs) Beautiful view, no need to go forward. Let's just stay here. And some of us are just holding on and trying to keep our churches right here in this spot as long as we possibly can. One of my clients put it this way. He said he went to his congregation and told him, the world is changing and we need to change. And a person looked him in the eye and said, we are all in favor, pastor, of you leading us in change. It's why we called a younger pastor. But here's the deal. You can't bring any changes till all of us die. And he had to to explain to them that the church would die before they would. They've done a better job of taking care of their bodies than they had their churches. And some of us just wonder, Well, maybe the key is to go back. What we need to do is tell people again about the great value of canoeing. We we are experts at river rafting. We need to help people understand, and we need to do circles and trips and tell people the great history of the water and the rivers and the canoeing. And if we could just go back and take it back, we can make canoeing great again. We can find ways in which we live in the past in this wonderful world And we find ourselves in this moment and we find ourselves struggling with this day of change, struggling about the fact that we have this deep nostalgia. I just want to tell you that if December 1963 ever comes back, Presbyterians are going to rule. We're awesome in 1963. At least Presbyterians who look like me. So what do we do? One of my friends tells a story about his his, um, spiritual director. His spiritual director is a Catholic priest, and the Catholic priest's brother is a Marine Corps jet fighter pilot. So I always like to think what Thanksgiving was like at their house. But for his birthday, the Marine took the priest onto the base and got permission for the priest to get to spend time in a flight simulator. Cool birthday present. At the end of the time, after they'd had a chance to try the different kind of what it was like to be in a flight simulator, the priest gets out, he looks at the guy training him and asks him a question, so why do you guys use flight simulators for all your training? And the man puts it this way, at the moment of crisis, you will not rise to the occasion, you will default to your training. At the moment of crisis, you don't rise to the occasion, you default to your training. My friends, we were trained for Christendom. We were trained, what do, you, what do you do in default mode? What do you do when there's a challenge in your community? What do you do when there's a changing world all around us? What do we do with it? Most of us were trained in preaching programs and pastoral care. We talk about it. We, one of my friends said it this way, we Presbyterians are so good at talking about stuff, after a while we think we've actually done it, right? <laughs> we preach a sermon series, we give a message, we write a book, we talk about it and think what's done. Or we create a program that will try to address it. Or maybe we'll just care for people a little more. But what happens when your church, you feel as if your church is dying, when no one's interested in your sermons, when they, when they will not show up for the very programs they asked you to do, 
and you can't even get close enough with them to care for them because they don't trust you. We were trained for a different context. We were trained for rivers, not for mountains. We need to learn a new way of leading. One of the reasons why I, want to, I use this metaphor is that what it, you don't need to do is try harder. If you can leave here with nothing today, please hear me tell you that to paddle harder when there ain't no water is a waste of energy. So instead, we need to be trained for a different way. Okay, I'm going to ask you to do something. I don't know how this lands in Methodist circles and Presbyterian circles. They'd kick me out for this one, but I'm going to try this. What I'd like you to do is turn to the person next to you and have a one-minute conversation. Can you do that? If you don't like the person next to you, make an excuse to go to the bathroom and sit next to somebody else. <laughs> but but I'm, going to give you, I'm going to give you like one minute each, and here's the conversation. I want you to focus in on one concrete thing. For the rest of the time that I have with you, I want to focus in on one, you have you put in your, in your head one particular challenge in your church. What is the thing you can't get traction on? What's the thing you keep talking about over and over and over again? What's the challenge that is in front of you? And I want you to just share it with each other. I'm going to give you exactly two minutes, and I'll tell you when the one-minute no morning is. So you said to the person next to you if, you, if you want to use three, it's okay, but don't do one, don't do four, and don't turn this into like a coffee thing. you got two minutes. Go. <laughs> 